Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Cara, for inviting me. I'm extremely happy and honored to give this presentation. Um, those of you who don't know me, my background is I'm a urologist. I've been a member of this society for, for many years, 40 years or something like that. Um, I joined Faring 20 years ago and uh, just to try to work in the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm still working in Faring for now 20 years. Thanks to my collaborator, Christian Yule, who has been essential in uh, producing some of these data we have here. And we have, if any, in Faring experienced personalized medicine, I would say on a high level and shown exactly what you asked for as this clinical relevance. Um, so here are our disclosures. We are fully paid by Faring. We are not getting anything extra for this presentation today. Um, most medical treatments have been designed for the average patient. Treatments can be very successful some, for some patients, but not for others. Barack Obama said that last year when he launched the Precision Medicine Initiative of Personalized Medicine. And I agree with that. Here's another example. Simon showed the closed uh, air conditioning system in offices are designed for average males of 70 kilos, resulting in that females complaining of freezing. Just another type of personalized, could we say, behavior. And here's a little hint to ICS, are we ready to personalize medicine? In my mind, no, we are not. And here I know what I'm talking about, because I have now been living with a terminology called OAB for many, many years. All of these that also Sender showed when he said he was not in his comfort zone. I, I would not like to hear you talk when you are in your comfort zone then. <laughs> But this is basically the same, but, but all these targets that you see here on this slide, oh, what, is this a pointer? Yes, all these targets, conditions, diseases in, in them could qualify for the diagnosis OAB. Dear ICS, you need to stand up and get these things changed because if we are going into personalized medicine, we cannot have broad definitions like that. And developing a drug, and that's what I know what I'm talking about. OAB has been triggering us several times in order to explain what is nocturia because nocturia is also part of OAB. So th that was just a little provocation. But, but I think we need to be better in defining what it is we are talking about and not just have commercializable uh, definitions. This is just, as also Senda said, another mechanism in, in regulating voiding dysfunctions. That's the urine reabsorption that happens in the kidneys. So with these two slides, there are many, many targets to attack. And on top of that, we are now trying to define drugs with specific gender uh, sex differences. How did we start this? And this is interesting, and I think, uh, I think many people, or uh, I say can learn from this, but it actually started as a safety problem. Desmopressin has a potential inherent safety problem that we wanted to solve. Started with that 15 years ago. This is from a trial in Nocturia where patients are given desmopressin for the treatment of nocturia on a polyuric background. We see some patients develop hyponatremia, some mild, some very severe, some really severe, down to 120. And we started looking at that, and we found some characteristics here. First of all, you can see uh, down here we have the age of the patients, up here we have the serum sodium, and we agreed with some experts that 130 was probably where you will start getting concerned. We see two things here, or oh, we see many more things, but two important things. Hyponatremia drops below to below 130, especially happens in old age. 
One more thing that is interesting is it's more severe in females, which are the triangles, and more common in the circle, the closed circles, in males. So this is a genetic difference. Talking to experts in hyponatremia, they say, but this is, this is commonly seen in females as more severe and more f uh, in, in females than in males, and also in, in high age. So nothing really happened there. Uh, then we start looking at literature, and Rauner Asplund from Sweden uh, did a study in fe females and males, uh, and uh, he also knew that females were more sensitive to changes in level of arginine vasopressin, and he showed that females actually did not really have any uh, difference in uh, arginine vasopressin uh, day and night as opposed to males where males had a much higher level of arginine vasopressin. We did show in children uh, the circadian rhythmicity of uh, arginine vasopressin resulted in nighttime polyuria. We did not find any difference in children, but we explained why this was only a nighttime phenomenon, namely that patients with nighttime polyuria lack the circadian rhythmicity of arginine vasopressin. In a study done in Aarhus by one of my younger colleagues there, um, under the leadership of Jens Christian Dürhus, my old mentor, showed normal circadian rhythms of males and females, again confirming that males had higher levels of arginine vasopressin antidiuretic hormone than females. So definitely, the gender difference is established in endogenous production of arginine vasopressin. We did more studies uh, in, in our company on nocturia because we realized that we might have given too high dosages for, uh, as explaining this development of hypermetremia. So what we did was that we prescribed or we tested now down to 10 micrograms where we in the old study started with 100 micrograms. So we wanted to see what happened. That's logic if you go down in dose. And what you can see here is a very nice dose response on anti nighttime antidiuresis. The higher the dose, the, the more antidiuresis you generate. Very nice dose response curve. We still had the problem with more hyponatremia in females. So when we split the dynamic responses, females here and males here, you can clearly see that females obtain a maximum antidiuretic response at 25 micrograms as opposed to males who had to have 50 micrograms to obtain the same antidiuretic response. Twice as high the dose in males compared to females. This also explains why females have more adverse events than males. So it seems that uh, the puzzle is getting there. There is a genetic basis, and now we come into something that is not my comfort zone. I don't speak as fast as sender outside of my comfort zone, but I'll try to explain what this is. Genetic basics for sex difference uh, uh, on AVP and of course also of desmopressin is on the V2 receptor. And the vasopressin V2 receptor is located on the X chromosome, which we know females have two of and males have only one. We are blessed with only one. The V2 gene is sitting here, and this position has the probability of escaping the so-called X gene, X chromosome inactivation that females have on all their X chromosomes in order not to be super, super uh, individuals. So this escapes, and, and that is the reason that females have twice times, two times higher response to different levels. And this was also uh, confirmed by Babalis and his group by rat experiments where you see a much higher messenger RNA in, in, male, in, 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 in females than in males. We looked at uh, pharmacokinetics of desmopressin because we were questioned, is this because of higher body size, body weight of males, but when you correct for body size, no, it's not a pharmacokinetic problem, it's a pharmacodynamic problem. 
This is Christian Yule's paper from American Journal of Physiology, clearly showing that 25 mic microgram obtains maximum antidiuresis, increasing dose does not do anything, and males needed 50 micrograms to obtain the same antidiuresis. Same in a Japanese study. Finally, and this is the last slide almost, children, we did the same in children, but given that children have a lower sensitivity, a higher sensitivity to desmopressin, it does not translate into a clinical practice to change the dosing in children. But um, as you can see here, female, the white uh, girls uh, mature earlier or uh, obtain maximum effect at lower levels of AVP than do boys. That is illustrated here in a very sensitive uh, system in, in, uh, in children. So conclusion, early findings of sex difference in the dynamic effect of desmopressin have demonstrated the increased receptor density in females compared to males. This is a known fact today. There is a sex-specific dosing effect in adults Owing to their lower sensitivity to V2 agonists, the sex-specific dosing effect is not justified in children and adolescents yet. Further to that, there are other urological uh, genetic factors in the prune belly syndrome, where the mutation uh, affects the M3 acetylcholine receptors, resulting in that the detrusor muscle does not maybe react to acetyl acetylcholine uh, uh, um, drugs. And uh, the urofacial OCOA syndrome, the same, uh, where we have uh, some uh, mutations in the nerve endings invading the fetal bladder, explaining some of this. Finally, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis also have some genetic uh, aspects in it that worsens in females and, and less uh, severe in males. So similar. So there are other potentials for this gene mutations in urological syndromes, such as prune belly and Ocoa syndrome has been found. Personalized medicine is to be based on genetics as well as age, sex, and race. Unidentified aspects on the efficacy and safety of pharmacological interventions could be revealed by larger database subgroups analysis focusing on age and genetic aspects, sex, race, and congenital urinary tract diseases, for instance. Uh, so I can encourage other societies with access to large databases to start looking at this because that might reveal that there are explanations for good and bad responders, safety concerns, etc. But again, being a bit old-fashioned, we need to remember to treat the right patients based on the right characterization before treatment initiation. That remains the best way. Not, and I'm saying this because we did studies on what are practicing doctors prescribing their patients. Males get prostate medicine, females get OAB. Which type? That depends on which pharmaceutical representative visited them last. That is basically the essence of our market research, and I think we can do better as a society in, in, in educating in these things. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jens, very much. We, we came back to urology again. Uh, any questions from the floor for Guinness Peter? What, what would you say is your next step? I think for desmopressin, it, it, is, it is solved. Uh, we might go uh, in the metabolic way that Sender and Cara also pointed at. We might have a product that is a little, long, little, little too long-lasting, and, and, and we might need a shorter acting. So, but but we, 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 we need to live with these data that the, the sex difference on V2 receptors in the kidney is an established fact today. And how we can circumvent that by giving the same dose by uh, drugs with faster metabolism or whatever, I don't know, but, but that could be the next step for, for the V2 agonists in order to obtain an even better safety. I guess that's where the personalized aspect lies into it. Absolutely. Any other questions, any possible questions? Thank you all very much for your perseverance in this new subject area.